Hello and welcome back to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. And with me again today is Nico, of course, right? Hello. Yeah, as always, as, as chatty as always. So we're going to do a very quick recap of what we were discussing with Professor Stephen Curry last week. And then we're going to take it on from there. Nico, you want to be my man of many words this time? Uh, so last week we had uh, Stephen Curry on and we talked about the de declaration on research assessment. Um, and he told us like what it contains, how it was um, uh, first drafted and how he joined it. Also, I think he mentioned some things about his personal uh, career, and it was very interesting to see how he went from being like uh, fully on science now to a more administrative uh, task um, that he's doing at the Imperial College. Definitely, and this time we're gonna get into a bit more granular details about how uh, you know a person who signs up to Dora, what is expected. And more, more such clear information, which is probably going to make you want to sign Dora as well. So it's open to every everyone in the scientific community to sign and uptake. So, for example, our dear friend Nico here is already a signee. That is true. And uh, I would, I'm planning to sign it as soon as I end recording this uh, intro. So, without any further ado, let's uh, get on with the discussion with Professor Stephen Curry on the Declaration on Research Assessment or Dora. Okay, so let's say uh, I'm a president of some kind of university and um, people are telling me that I should sign DORA. Um, now, if I would like to sign DORA, wouldn't that mean that the whole hiring process would take longer and make it more complicated and I would be also be compromised in the decisions I can make um, during this process? So what is your take on this? If you commit to DORA, um, you start to think about ways to make better decisions. Because the, the 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 reliance on the journal impact factor isn't necessarily the best uh, way to make a decision about a piece of research or a particular researcher, uh, and if you really want to make good decisions about the people that you hire and that you promote and reward, you do want to think about the whole range of activities that you want to incentivize. And if you are only going to incentivize one particular activity, which is publishing in top tier journals then that does lead to you know enormous pressures on the system that are very unhealthy you know we see an enormous um rise in um you know mental ill health among academics and even you know at, at the lower level at these more junior levels i mean early career researchers and phd students who spend their time worrying that if they can't get a nature paper then their career is over i mean what a terrible thing to do to somebody who is in their mid 20s and at the outset of their career i mean we should be you know uh, harnessing their intellect and you know getting them to produce their best work and rewarding them for it it doesn't shouldn't matter where they publish it what should matter is our ability to tell the quality of the research and if you're if your president or your institutional leader is telling you that they can't judge research unless they can see the name of the journal that it's published in, well, then I think that's not a very defensible position. And we all know, you know, when you go to a conference and you hear a talk of somebody presenting new results, you know, you can be blown away by that. You know, I've had it you know, many as a time at a conference and you've not yet, it's not been published anywhere, but you can immediately tell that, you know, this is a really big step change in the field or this was a really clever or innovative uh, piece of science, you know, so... Um, so I think it's about, you know, thinking about how you can make even better decisions. Um, I don't think there's no compromise involved in signing Dora. Um, and, you know, I would there is concern. I mean, I, OK, because, um, you know, everybody plays by the impact factor game. That's the that's the trouble. Um, and sometimes even, you know, publishing in Nature or science, that's a, the number of papers you have published in those journals are, are things that count towards university league tables. That's what the Shanghai League Tables does. They count nature papers and science papers. They don't count papers in any other journal. I mean, it's it's nuts, absolutely nuts. 
But you can see why then universities keen to do well in those rankings, they would place a very high premium on publishing in just those two journals. And yet we know that an enormous amount of brilliant science is not published in those journals, you know. Um, and so, uh, you know, th th you just get these crazy um, features of the way science is done um, because of that. And as I said before, you get this uh, this retardation of publication, which acts against the public interest. So, you know, is your president happy to go to, um, to the government and say, you know, we've done this great piece of research, but we're not going to publish it until we get it into the journal that we want. And it might take 18 months. Is that OK? And you're basically saying, well, I'm going to stop science for 18 months. Is that all right with you? Okay, yes, I totally agree with your points. Um, now, I just think that it's possible that a president of a university can feel compromised by all the rules that suddenly are imposed on them as soon as they sign DORA. Well, okay, so well, DORA is not very prescriptive, okay? It's not a big, long set of rules um, in, in the way. And at, at DORA, the organization, we are much more interested in people thinking about the spirit of the declaration. It's not like it's a holy text that can only be interpreted by certain theologians or high priests. Um, it's fairly uh, straightforward in its language. I mean, it is a little bit biased towards the sciences because it was, you know, it emerged out of the cell and molecular biology community, which is one of the reasons it maybe doesn't speak quite as powerfully to humanities communities as it as it should do. But but the main thing is just saying, um, you know. Don't use impact factors. Don't place undue weight on impact factors when you're doing assessment. But there are so many other things that you can do that we will enable you to arrive at better decisions. You know, it's important to judge a work on its own merits, you know, and you be the judge of that. Don't 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 subcontract that to a journal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely agree with that uh, point. Moving along. So I can see that Nico is extremely passionate about uh, this topic and he really wants to ask a lot of follow-up questions, and I, I can see that you're very passionate about it as well. So, kind of want to ask when you found your passion to, you know, decide to invest your time into changing the research assessment system. So, when did you join Dora, and when did you decide to invest time into doing this? Um, so, I started writing a blog about being a scientist in 2008. And um, uh, being a blogger is supposed to be a, a rather insular thing. You know, you sort of sit alone in your room and, and type out about how angry with the world you are. Uh, but actually, I find it, it made me think about the business of science much more deeply than I had ever done before. Until that point, I had been very much concentrating on my own career and I had kind of played the game. I was aware of impact factors and the importance of publishing in the right journals and I had done it with the best of them uh, to make sure that I got promoted and continued to be funded and whatnot. Uh, but I it was then thinking about, you know, scholarly publication about open access, which to me seemed like a really good idea. Uh, and then there is an interaction between open access and research assessment because it's difficult for new journals to get established. If they don't have a reputation and they don't have an impact factor, then people don't want to publish in them. And yet, so, it, so the, the obsession with impact factors was one of the things that was impeding the uptake of, of open access. And so that got me into the, the business of thinking about, um, about uh, that. And in 2012, what was it? I wrote a blog post, which was one of my most widely read blog posts called Sick of Impact Factors, where I kind of diagnosed what I thought was the problem. Um, and um, sort of towards the end of that year, then there was the meeting in San Francisco where the declaration was drafted. And I knew some of the people involved and I got word um, just before it was launched that it was going to come. And I was, you know, I was given the chance to sign, you know, from day one. And I was very happy to do so. And I, I did sign from day one. So I'm not really, you, you don't join dora you basically sign it to say that you 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 kind of commit to and you support the idea and you commit to kind of doing it and so 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 from even before dora existed then i was writing about research assessment and i got just got more and more involved and i was very keen to promote it i wrote about it but i could see that in the first two or three years you know i would give talks and i would talk about open access and i would talk about dora and research assessment and I would always ask, you know, hands up who in the room has heard of Dora. 
And it was usually only one or two people put their hands up. It, it really wasn't getting much traction. Um, the, the acronym was unfortunate because DORA, if you search for it on Google, you get there's a very popular children's book called DORA the Explorer. Uh, who and so you don't really get a hit on Dora, and also because it was it didn't have its own website. It was just Dora was just part of the ASCB website, so it didn't have a big presence, and they didn't have the resources to to do much about it. And so the website was a bit, you know, uh, was a bit slow, wasn't very functional. And so there were a group of us started to talk about, okay, well, what can we do to jazz things up a bit? And so some of those. Uh, then people like people like uh, Stuart Taylor at the Royal Society, uh, Robert Kiley at Welcome, Katrina McCallum, who was at PLOS but is now at Hindawe, um, and Bernd Pulverer, who's at EMBO, uh, were kind of interested in in really pushing it. And so there was a little initiative, Nucleus formed, and a small number of organizations committed some money. And then so that now allowed us then to hire a program director in 2017. And I, at that point then, I became chair of the the steering committee. So, and it's it's important for me because you know, as I say, over the years of sort of writing and thinking about, you know, how research is conducted. You know, research is just an amazing thing, and it's you know, and I guess in the past year, people have seen what an important activity it is, and how important it is that results are openly shared, that they're critiqued rapidly, so that we don't get you know the wrong messages about things that do or do not um, help people who are infected by uh, uh, SARS coronavirus. Um, uh, and also that we assess more broadly um, uh, and really value the people. And, and what I, you know, one of the things I have particularly enjoyed about being a researcher is all the different people that I've met and worked with um, over the years. It's, you know, okay, there is, of course, we all enjoy a little bit of intellectual stimulation, but it's the cut and thrust of debate and interacting with people and seeing what others can do and how you can build on their work and they can build on yours. There is a real great community spirit, I think. And and it is it is in danger of being crushed by the rush to metricization. And you can see why it happens, because uh, in the last sort of 30 or 40 years, most governments in most countries have started to really invest a lot more than they ever used to do, certainly compared to 100 years ago, in research and development. So now it is, you know, two, three, four percent of GDP is spent on R&D. Um, and governments naturally want to know what they're getting for their money. And so they want to hold people accountable and they want to measure it and they want an easy way to measure it. And so, you know, accountability and transparency, what we do with the money, it's important to give a good account of that. I think it's important to be able to have a conversation between the scientific community and the government and the public that it represents that, you know, actually a lot of the time scientists will work in the lab and the thing is a total failure. OK, the hypothesis is null, doesn't work. And that's a normal part of the process. OK, you can't you're never going to you're never going to eliminate the failure from the system. But you mustn't penalize people for it because otherwise they, they then won't try. But because we are we are so fixated on success, you tend to get a bit of incrementalism going on. Um, and also then, again, we, we don't really focus on, um, you know, incentivizing really good mentorship. I mean, it does happen. It, you know, it still happens within the existing system, but it's maybe more the exception rather than the rule. And it's partly because... Uh, I think our systems of reward focus more on individuals than on teams and team effort and team building. And I think that's to the detriment of the enterprise as a whole. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe to follow up on this, do you think that the whole uh, academic system needs to somehow change um, before you get like a good change of the whole research assessment? Because I mean, positions like yours, for example, um, I mean, they're more administrative, I assume. Um, and I think they should be valued just as much. And then there might be positions, for example, for just teaching um, that because you have to, if you spend a lot of time on teaching, you can do a much better job than someone who is busy doing their own research and on the side has to teach some undergrads who they uh, like barely know, maybe even. So do you think like something is necessary to change there before we can uh, move forward? Well, I think there is scope for a certain amount of healthy evolution. I don't think, 
I don't think the system is fundamentally broken and and needs to be you know uh, taken apart and rebuilt from the ground up. Uh, and the world simply doesn't work that way anyway, so that isn't going to happen. Um, I mean, at my own university, we do have teaching fellow positions, so that's for somebody who's employed um, um, 100% as a teacher. Um, often they are, you know, they're recruited. There are people who are postdocs who decide actually I'm not going to go into a career in research, but they like university life, and so um, they can um, they can convert to become teaching fellows. I still think there's great value, and it is important that academics based at universities are involved in undergraduate teaching as well, because I certainly know that certainly at Imperial, one of the things that our students, our undergraduate students, really value particularly in their final year, is being taught by people who are working, you know, at the cutting edge, who are active in research, who are running labs. And then, of course, you're then able to offer the students, you know, real lab experience, you know, towards the end of their degree when they've mastered the core curriculum. And that, you know, certainly see a lot of value in that. I do think there is more scope for um, uh, sort of permanent um, scientific officer positions. Okay, it's, I think there's too much competition, and the way that funding has been um, uh, uh, has evolved in the United Kingdom is that uh, you know there's relatively little core funding is offered to universities, and so basically all the research money that you get is you go out and you apply for grants. Okay, and um, and competition is a good thing uh, to a degree. I think without a bit of competition, people get lazy and a bit tired and careless. Uh, but you can easily then shade into hyper competition. And my my plan for well, at least for the UK, but my plan for the world would be that you know if you get a faculty position at a university, if you kind of made it that far, then you should be granted you know one position to, for someone to work in your lab on a maybe five to seven year term that's renewable as long as the lab is still reasonably productive they don't set a, a high bar and that would allow you to employ someone as a, a permanent researcher either a, like a senior technician or a, a senior scientist because i have met you know many postdocs you know there are many more postdocs and phd students than there are faculty positions okay and not every phd student i think realizes this at the beginning of their career i think more should because it's not you know it's not a it's not a, um, an, um, an automatic career lad pipeline nevertheless i think there are a lot of people who, who just love doing science love being in the lab but have no particular ambition to run a run a research group or to become a university academic where they would have to run a research group and teach as well they just want to be in the lab and they're good at it and I and to my mind, if every uh, PI had one of those positions, every other you know position in their lab, they they earn by through grant applications, which are awarded competitively. But I think if you had that one resource, it would a create a stable position for a lot of people who who just see science as a job that they would love to do. They they amass a huge amount of experience that means they're very good when you've got master students and PhD students coming through the lab because they can support them. And then if you do end up in a period where, you know, you don't have a grant and you've got nobody, well, you've still got one person who can then develop and do the, you know, do the preliminary um, work that you need then to get your next grant. And so there's a, a, a degree of stability and efficiency built into the system. Now, of course, that would be quite an expensive thing to do and would carve out quite a bit of the science budget but if you're hiring the right people in the first place as group leaders and then as the uh, research scientists then um, uh, then I think you you know you end up with a better system so I think there are changes like that I don't I mean I know in some countries and in some research institutes there are positions a bit like that uh, but it's it's certainly not the norm not in the UK anyway I'm not quite sure what it, what it's like in the Max Planck yeah, actually, uh, so in our institute, that's exactly what we have. Like every director, at least, they have like one senior uh, researcher position. And it really helps the lab uh, as a whole, right? I mean, they can also supervise new people. Um, and they have like, they build up so much expertise over the years doing experiments and analysis that uh, they can help uh, progress with uh, all other projects in the lab as well. And uh, they don't have to do a lot of the um, like um, 
manager uh, tasks uh, that uh, the PI has to do. So I think this is, uh, yeah, it, it's a really nice position to have. And I, th I guess the Max Planck Society can afford it. That's why uh, well, they it, have it. It's a decision about your priorities. and But I, I think, well, yeah, well, it's good to hear that it's happening in practice in the Max Planck. But I, I think the idea has got a great deal of merit. So, so uh, you, you previously mentioned there's a lot of internationality within the DORA. So you have uh, people from different parts of the world, like India and China, Europe, and also you mentioned Japan and you mentioned the States. So almost it's an it's a global endeavor, right? So do you see there's a difference in terms of the way people think about research evaluation in these different places? Do you see the, the, the perspective that they have towards certain types of research when you have discussions with these people? Um, I think there's a great deal of commonality. So there's a, you know, there's a shared language and a shared understanding of it. What we do see, and we've certainly heard this from our advisory board members in Africa and in South America, is that they feel under pressure, and it, sometimes it comes from their own governments, to to publish in top journals and to perform well in university league tables. And so they're under pressure to play in a game that they had no part in constructing. And so whether they like it or not, then they are kind of expected to, to follow these rules. And there's a certain amount of resentment, I think you can understand, um, uh, arises from that. And I think at the same time, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, drives university league tables is the idea that, you know, every university should be uh, an Oxford University or a Caltech or a Harvard, you know, a sort of hugely international, uh, globally impacting, you know, um, research intensive institution. And not every university has to do that at all. Even within the UK, we have a, a sort of diversity of institutions that you know serve different needs, and some of them are very important institutions, you know, within their locality. And that's a perfectly good thing for a university to do, but they will get penalised for it because you know the university league tables are measuring research output and and citations, and are not measuring. Uh, the quality of your teaching of undergraduates and uh, and whether or not your research is actually serving your local community in, in important ways. And that is something, a message and a, uh, that we have heard um, across the world is that, you know, many universities in developing countries, they play, they're playing a really important role in helping those developing countries develop, you know, and, and but their priorities are around you know, local agriculture or local industry needs um, and or, you know, training up, you know, a generation of young graduates who are equipped to in IT skills that will, you know, build infrastructures that aren't yet present, for example. So, so you know, there's it's recognizing that diversity and being able to say that, you know, not every university has to be an apple. You know, some of them can be oranges or, you know, it's quite all right for that one to be a banana, you know, and, and OK, some people might prefer bananas to apples, but but it's okay for things to be different, and and it's acknowledging that uh, that I think is that I think is important. Yeah. Okay, that's a that's, that's an interesting perspective because I think this is important. That a lot of times I, I can speak from personal experience that in India when we have these university league rankings, they use these QS rankings or something, and and it, it's it's a it's a matter of pride. Sometimes, because my the university where I went to was a private university, but they were doing some research, but it, the primary focus was teaching. And the, the, the pride was, even with so much teaching output, we still have the research rankings in this level. So it's, it's just a matter of pride for so many of these universities to take into consideration. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, no, at, at the same time, there is a certain value in some degree of international benchmarking so that you know where, you know, how am I doing relative to this other, you know, um, country whose university system we admire or who which seems to be producing, you know, quite a lot of bang for its buck or whatever. So, that, you know, there's it's not an entirely silly thing to do. And certainly in some countries, I know this has happened in Eastern Europe, for example, I think also in China a little bit, um, the, the, you know, there was a worry at a time about um, the system was really rather insular, a lot depended a lot on who you knew and, you know, how you would advance. And so, and, and that was kind of unhealthy for the system as a whole, because it was a system of patronage. And because there weren't international comparisons, nobody kind of noticed the harm that it was doing. So, you know, so clearly, you know, international comparisons 
is a useful piece of information. Uh, quite hard to do because obviously, you know, uh, it's, uh, countries differ enormously in culture and expectations and uh, and in legal frameworks and, and the way, even the way that their university systems work. I mean, in, in Germany, it's really very different from the United Kingdom, you know, in terms of the, the historical development of the university system is really very different. And in Germany, my understanding is that, you know, the, the, the universities are very important for their regions. Whereas in the UK, and so people tend to go to their local university, but in the UK, it, it's it's seen rather, really rather differently because the system was dominated by a very small number of institutions for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, another question that I had is in an unrelated direction is that most of the time when we talk about research evaluation, it's, it's more or less academic research. Although there's a vast amount of non-academic research also taking place such as like for, for let's say in, in terms of pharmaceuticals or or because and and these companies and people in these companies also tend to publish in journals sometimes so how how do how do these factor in when we're talking about research evaluation if if someone was in a pharmaceutical company and tries to leave and go into an academic job would there be a fair way to assess this person without uh, yeah. Well, there wouldn't if you were very dependent on journal publication and then thinking about the types of journals. I mean, some pharmaceutical companies and some, you know, STEM companies, they do permit publication, but many do not. You know, they're very nervous about IP. And so they don't tend to let people publish and they pay higher salaries, partly because that's the quid pro quo for not being in academia. Um, but if you have a system whereby you can judge somebody on their their own merits at about you know whether or not they've you know contributed to a, a successful program of drug development or whatever then then you have a system for um, assessing whether or not they would you know fit into a, a university environment and so there would be a bit more um, a little bit more mobility but I've always I mean I know some academics they look down their noses a little bit about people who go into industry but to me it's every bit as demanding a challenge and sometimes more so. And, you know, I've a lot of some of my work was involved in looking at protein drug interactions. And so I did a little bit of consulting for a number of pharmaceutical companies. But I was always impressed by the people that worked there because, OK, they didn't have to produce papers, but they actually had to produce something that people wanted to buy. And that, you know, and that means a drug that works. And of course, the attrition pipeline is horrendous and actually i would always ask them have you worked on a project that has resulted in a drug that is now for sale and most of them said no because of course the failure rate is so high it's 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 very difficult and then that's not because they were bad at their job it's because it's a really there's a really high bar for success but in academia your bar for success as well you know can i write up a project you know do a few experiments and then write up a project and then get some publisher to publish it you know you can always get it published so so it's it's you know it's not as exacting a bar we tend to well i guess internally we set our own bars in in many in many respects but of course the system is judging us then by another set of metrics and bars too but uh, but and again i always tell my students uh, and again I, I think at some research intensive universities because the students are taught by academics who the only thing they know is life and academia they transmit this idea that that is the highest type of experience intellectual experience that is on offer to you in your future career and i think that's a bunch of nonsense i mean that is there are so many other demanding jobs uh, that require not just intellectual skills, but people skills and problem solving and creativity, you know, working in government, working in industry. I mean, all of these things. And, and to me, whenever I hear that point of view, it strikes me as extremely narrow minded. And it comes from people who have very, very limited experience of life. So and shouldn't be advising students. <laughs> Yeah, that's very much true. Um, well, maybe for a last question. Um, what like from your point of view, how long do you think it will take uh, for this whole system of research assessment to become uh, more common, um, like in the whole world? Um, as you were mentioning before, that it has to be, or it would ideally be globally that it changes, right? Okay. Well, I so see you're you basically asking me to put a number on something again. <laughs> uh, I, I don't no, know. I have no idea. I, but however, I you know I do see. 
palpable change. And I think that's that's thanks in part to Dora, I think. But this is an agenda and an issue that many different organizations and stakeholders have taken up. There is a, there was a thing called the Leiden Manifesto, which came out of the bibliometrics and the scientometrics community, where they kind of recognize that although actually they're very interested in using quantitative methods to look at the way that science works, uh, they recognize that some of their measurements that they produced are then being um, misused. There's lots of funders are interested in this, and there is a growing concern, I think, among funders and institutions about the whole culture of research, about the way that researchers behave, about you know fraud, um, you know, um, um, uh, about research ethics, um, about the behavior of researchers within their groups, and the uh, abuse of power dynamics, the bullying that goes on, sexual harassment of uh, female researchers, racism within uh, the, the, the culture. And, um, and I think what we need to bring back to the center is a focus on researchers as people, okay? And I think all of us would like to have uh, a rewarding career in science, if that's what we choose, or in any other endeavor that we that we choose, and be working within a system that values people. And part of that is actually recognizing that many of the things that researchers and scholars do are people oriented, you know, and it is, you know, even if you are thinking about I'm producing really work that's, you know, going to be groundbreaking, um, if it is in medical research, then ultimately, of course, the, your goal is to prevent sickness and death, you know, so it's about, you know, helping people. Uh, but we tend to focus and the, the system makes us focus on the blooming paper, you know, and you forget about the person who's at the end of it, who's the beneficiary, and you forget about the person who's at the beginning of it, who is the investigator or the researcher. And so, uh, so all of the elements, you know, Dora's focus on research assessment, the concerns about the culture of research, the concerns about equality and diversity and inclusion and making sure that, you know, everybody, you know, that all talents are recognized and the push to open science, which is about recognizing the interest that the public has and that small businesses and other industries and health systems have in the products of research in all their various forms, that those sort of intersect and come together on, on a focus, you know, that really should be on uh, researchers as people. So that's, you know, and, and I, do, I do detect lots of institutions are, you know, moving that direction. Dora, for example, is cited uh, as part of Plan S, which is this bold move within Europe to change the way that we publish. But they recognize that that can't really come about unless we, at, at the same time, revise the way that we assess people and forget about fixating on journals and then and, and concentrate on the Dora principles. And globally, I think this conversation is happening. So we were participated in a meeting of the Global Research Council last November, which meets regularly, and they are very much taking up the agenda of responsible research assessment. And so that's very much in tune with the Dora principles. So, so it is a conversation that is taking place around the world. I am by nature an optimist, but also a realist. You know, there are many barriers in the way. There are many people who currently benefit from the system as it operates now. They have played it well. They have no interest in changing it. They would even defend the idea that, you know, you can recognize quality through journal metrics. And so, you know, there were, there are still arguments to be had and to be and to be won. And it is difficult, I think, particularly for universities, because they worry that their reputation, their ability to attract students and attract uh, researchers is affected by all of these metrics. And so, but I think if there's a, there, there is a common vision and if we can get concerted action, then, you know, we really can move things. And there are some very encouraging signs. There's a very bold experiment going on in the Netherlands right now where the whole university system is revising its approach to um, to uh, uh, assessment of researchers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Thanks a lot for this very comprehensive explanation of the progress and what needs to be uh, done in order to uh, yeah make research, I guess, the whole field of research uh, better. And thanks a lot for joining us. We, it was an absolute pleasure to yeah, have thanks. you on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you both. Well, that was a fantastic discussion, uh, wasn't it? Anyway, I think with that we've come to our long recording of. Uh, 
us having a discussion with Professor Stephen Curry. And uh, yeah. We hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you are still listening to this, are you sure you don't want to join the podcast team? Because, you know, if you're listening to this with so much intention and listening to this part of our outro, then probably the podcast team is a good fit for you. We have a role for you in here, definitely. If you do think that, join us and write to us at offspring.podcasts at phcnet.mpg.de. Well, if you're not listening, well, nah, no worries. We don't expect an email from someone who's not listening anyway. All right. We don't judge. Yeah, we, we don't judge. Anyway, with that, we've come to this end of this interview and this discussion. And we hope to see you all next week with another definitely very interesting episode. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye from both Nico and me. Bye-bye. Bye. Offspring Magazine, the podcast brought you with the Max Planck PhD in the Science Communication Working Group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Shant Ramkumar and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. Stay safe and see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye.